get connected for free. That supercharger connection. Just a couple of seconds and click. It's Boardman once again, except it appears we have Audi e-tron over there. They're not plugged in, but they're here. Not even sure if those CCS chargers are online yet, but the car seems to be pulling about 170 kilowatts. And yes, while I've been here before, I can't help but make another video about it because I just have to admit, I'm super duper grateful for you guys watching these things. Not only are you supporting this channel just by watching the videos, but also it's amazed me how many of you guys have used the referral codes. Like I maxed out my referral link, so I can't get any more referrals for this year, but that's okay because we've gotten thousands upon thousands of free supercharging miles so that now not only are these road trips free for us to do because the supercharging doesn't cost anything but also because i get to make a video on the experience we're actually making money by road tripping we're like in the positive we're profiting the more we travel and make these kinds of videos. So each time I try to have some kind of different goal in mind, I don't want to just be like, okay, I'm charging again. Honestly, we need to be more thankful and grateful to Electrify America, mostly because they make content a whole lot more interesting. I love watching videos of other people that spent over $100,000 on their EV, only for them to be stuck at an Electrify America station, waiting for a Chevy Bolt to move, or waiting for the station to come online, or complaining about Electrify America. Honestly, there's just so much more to talk about when you road trip with a CCS vehicle. Road tripping with a Tesla, uh, you gotta get a tad more creative, I guess, because it's honestly kind of boring. You know, you just plug in and it charges and it works. So the goal today is essentially to see how hot I can get the battery pack because on my last road trip video, it was like 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And I was still getting the little alert on the Model 3 claiming that the temperature of the battery pack is too cold. After all the preconditioning and it's hot out and I'm driving the car at 70 miles an hour, the battery pack still says, eh, it's, it's kind of cold. I'm no battery expert or chemistry guy or anything, but something tells me the reason LFP has such a great cycle life is something to do with the temperature. Like it just always runs cold. Even when it's hot out, even when it's under load, it's just very, very difficult to get an LFP battery pack to overheat. But you know, I was heading north on the last road trip. So it wasn't as crazy hot as it gets back in my home state where oftentimes it's well over 100 sometimes over 110 degrees fahrenheit so my hope is as we're heading back home today and we're driving at highway speeds and by the way this car is loaded to the gills like the frunk is packed the trunk is packed my wife is a miracle worker we had like packages and tech products that i was reviewing on my other channel shipped to my parents place where we were staying essentially now we're carrying more in the car than what we had on the way here. And we picked up a bunch of supplies, did some grocery shopping, found some great deals while we were traveling. So essentially the car is even more full, even heavier than it was previously. So my hope is we can get to the point where the Model 3 starts saying, yeah, the battery pack, it's just too hot. Your charging speed is limited due to battery temperature, but this time it's on the high end, not the low end. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if anyone else has experienced it, but that's my goal today. Overheat this freaking battery pack because it's way too cold cold all the time. Maybe I should stop focusing so much on my efficiency. The first three hours of driving, I've been averaging 210 watt hours per mile, which still amazes me considering, you know, how many people you can fit in this thing and how much stuff can fit in the trunk and the front. And you can still get close or sometimes over five miles per kilowatt hour. It's just kind of insane for the vast majority of vehicles on the road, considering they're all burning so much gasoline. Definitely nowhere near 130, 140 miles per gallon equivalent. But the other fun thing I would say about road tripping like this is it's been kind of educational for how efficiency is truly calculated. You know, we've got a lot of bodies or a lot of stuff in the car and I'm sure it's well over 4,000 pounds, but it doesn't actually make that big of an impact on your efficiency. Aptera is right, essentially, is what I'm saying. It all comes down to aerodynamics. I wonder how much better efficiency I could get if I remove those side view mirrors. I'm not going to do that anytime soon, but it might be a fun experiment in the future. Once the car is out of warranty and everything to try to remove the mirrors, see what kind of efficiency you can get. But another lesson I learned on my last drive here, which I didn't vlog simply because I was kind of just going back and forth between
between my parents' place and home. We just had to go home for a quick wedding and then we went back the next day. So there was a lot of repeat driving and I know this is gonna be kind of a repeat for a lot of you already, but I was kind of in a hurry because I wanted to get to my parents' place. So even though we know it's possible to get there from this charger, I went a little bit faster than usual. I was going over 80 miles per hour and because of that extra aerodynamic drag that you experience at those higher speeds, the car wasn't gonna make it. We were at like 6%, 5%, and we weren't that close to the house. So simply by going faster, I realized, well, now I got to stop again. So we had to make an additional stop somewhere in Spokane, Washington. And we had to top off essentially, even though we knew that it was possible to get there on a single charge, it was just a matter of speed. So essentially the faster you go, the more your arrow starts to eat into your energy consumption. On the Model 3, I can still get EPA estimated range at 65, 70 miles per hour. A lot of people out there think the only way to get your EPA EPA range is to go 50 or 45. In my experience, that's not the case, at least with the rear-wheel drive Model 3, which is an efficiency beast. You know, it's got the heat pump system and everything, so that helps a lot with it not consuming too much energy. But yeah, I definitely got substantially worse range than EPA when going over 70 miles per hour. But in my experience, that's about the cap. Of course, there's other variables like the wind or the elevation or the temperature outside. Depending on what kind of battery pack you have, it may affect your range because of how much energy is going towards conditioning that pack. And that's, you know, honestly, part of the reason that I don't feel like range at the end of the day, whether it's 270 or 300 or 320 or 350, really when range is that close, it doesn't make a massive impact on your driving experience. Because if you're in a situation like I am right now, we arrived at 23% state of charge here. And sure, we could have kept going. You know, I could have gone and gone maybe a bit further until we were at 5% or if our car had a range of 350 miles, okay, I could probably keep going for another hour, but sometimes when you're road tripping like this, there's huge stretches of no superchargers. So whether you can make it, you know, like 20 miles past the supercharger or 50, sometimes it doesn't matter. You just have to stop and charge anyway because there will be a long stretch of no superchargers. So if I had a long range Tesla right now, there wouldn't be a supercharger to skip. I would basically just arrive here at 40% instead of 20%, except I'd have, you know, 5,000 or $10,000 less money in my pocket. So because you can't necessarily have a supercharger exactly where you want at every step of the way. That's why the ultimate range number is kind of unnecessary because if you're like me driving efficient and you can get five miles per kilowatt hour, then I already have a 300 mile range Model 3. And if you're driving at 80 miles per hour with your long range Tesla, you might get to your destination a little bit faster, but you're still going to have pretty much the same range as me going at 70 miles per hour. So when range is that close, I honestly don't think it makes a big impact on your road trip ability. To me, what makes a much bigger difference is if you can skip these massive stretches of area that don't have superchargers, and that's where the Aptera would come in. You know, if you have a 600 to 1,000 mile range, yeah, that's gonna make a big impact because there's way more miles to pull from. But if we're just talking about the difference of 50 miles, 60 miles, 70 mile range difference, honestly, that's not going to impact your drive all that much. So hopefully this is an uneventful trip. I can hear the fans ripping on the car and just for the record, yes, while I did max out my referral code, I did change the referral code in my videos to switch to my friend Randy's code. I have to give him some credit because he's the one who got me into Teslas in the first place. But you guys have actually maxed out Randy's code already, so thank you for using his code. And now I've switched the referral code to his wife's Tesla, the Model Y Performance they just got, and already people are ordering with her code. So thank you once again for signing up, and I appreciate all of you for the free supercharging miles. Hopefully you get some too. We got this poor e-tron here, which I feel bad for because these tritium chargers that I checked out like three weeks ago are still not online. You know, they're still not active after all this time. They've got Chatamo, they've got CCS1, unfortunately, so they're dated from the beginning and they're not even working. I hope the e-tron owner didn't think that these chargers were gonna be online and he's now stuck here. That would definitely suck. I don't see a driver inside. I have no idea where they are, but yeah, this is kind of a, just waste of time and money in my opinion. I guess we'll need some CCS infrastructure but less and less as the years go by and it's not even online. Like what's the point? Greens don't light up or anything. There's nothing. Max is the way of the future. That's what we're using. Oh! Woo! They're passing us. They're probably over 20,000. We did it! 20,000 miles in less than a year. Don't tell our insurance. <laughs> <laughs> it's not raining. Autopilot 
why do you there's no way out there's no way out you cannot turn it off even though it you know it's working like it is functioning even though the wiper is doing literally nothing if anything it's actually covering up the camera for a split second it would technically perform better if I could turn it off but I cannot turn it off even if I just do cruise control Try I turning it off now. It's still using the cameras. Won't turn off. It's not open. Can't even use cruise control without the blades. It's going to wear out the blades quicker. Something pooped on the cameras, I think. There needs to be an option to tell the computer sometimes you're wrong. If someone's laying down on the back seat and saying the seat belt isn't buckled, I need to say, shut up. That should be an option. All right. I'm switching to Lucid. All right. Let me get fucking plugged into frickin' Klamath Falls. Who pooped on the camera? What the heck? That was one of those horrible scenarios in which I wish I had dumb cruise control because with adaptive cruise control, it still uses the camera. You know, even if you don't want to do auto steer, the wipers are going constantly and you can't turn it off. So I just have to sit there with my foot on the pedal the entire time. If you had dumb cruise control, the old fashioned kind, I wouldn't have to do that. <sighs> Robo taxis. Next year, I know. And just so you keyboard mechanics are aware, yes, we tried the windshield wiper fluid four separate times. Here's all the blue speckle on the mirrors to prove it. And no, using the windshield wiper fluid on four separate occasions did not fix the problem. The wipers just still wanted to keep wiping despite, uh, yeah, not much rain today. Uh, so that was very annoying. Well, I tried. We were able to get all the way from Klamath Falls to Chico, California. Got a lightning right next to us at the charge point. Not supercharging, though that would be really cool. Then right over here, a plaid. I love EV chargers. You can see so many cool vehicles in the same place. But yeah, even when the weather was over 95 degrees Fahrenheit, I never quite got the car to supercharge while it was over 100 degrees. I just couldn't get the weather to match up correctly. I guess there's just no way the LFP battery pack has to stay cold. That's just how it is by nature. Tesla just dropped some new model S's and X's though, right as we were coming home. So I'm almost back and I still have got some more work to do, make some more videos. But overall, I have driven about 37 or 4,000 miles in the past three weeks. I'm very tired. I feel like I know this car. I understand autopilot. I know its limitations. I get the charging curves. I get the wait times. I get the range. And honestly, it just makes me so grateful that we have an LFP Model 3. I think this is a seriously underrated chemistry. The fact that I'm trying to abuse it and trying to get it to overheat and I can't. Same thing can't really be said about a lot of other EVs out there that are having overheating problems. So ultimately what it's taught me is that that maximum range number that everybody obsesses about is not that big of a deal. Your charging curve, your charger availability, and your charging network have the much bigger impact on your road trip experience not so much what the maximum range number is. Yes, it is a factor. It does play into effect. Obviously, someone with a 100 mile range is gonna have a worse experience than someone with a 300 mile range. But once you get over the 200 mile range mark, it all starts to blur together. And honestly, it's far more likely that you're gonna wanna take a break, go to the restroom, get some food, then the car is going to need a charge. You know, this is the lowest range Tesla, other than I guess the Model X standard range might be setting some new low records now. But still, it's basically the cheapest Tesla Tesla you can buy and it's an amazing experience. Although I'm still frustrated by a lot of the stupidity of autopilot. It doesn't know what to do when lanes open up. I know people are going to tell me, well, Drew, just get FSD. Well, guess what? 90% of people don't have FSD anyway. So we probably shouldn't be acting like that's a good $200 a month solution for people. Also the windshield wipers going when there's just a little bit of crud on the lenses. That's annoying, but nothing that a little napkin couldn't fix. And the fact that we didn't have to pay much for this entire road trip is amazing. So thanks again to you guys for watching. Thanks for using the referral code. And thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly. Seriously, helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos. So thanks again. Have an excellent rest of your day.